first, uh, let me say thank you um, to the forum for inviting Nexa to this presentation. And uh, secondly, apologies for not being there in person. Um, we were asked to speak a little bit about uh, uh, prevention. Let's see, where do I advance this? Prevention and preparation for nuclear disasters. And the, the brief, all right, there you go, second slide. The brief was basically uh, to, to speak a little bit about, about preparedness and um, prevention, but also about the role of science in, in preparation and prevention for nuclear disasters. And I'll, I'll try and cover those fields and I'll try and make it a vaguely interesting by, by bringing some examples also. The outline of this would to tell you a little bit about the nuclear facilities in South Africa and define what a nuclear disaster would be, and then speak a little bit about prevention and preparedness, uh, and then about science, a little bit about past nuclear disasters. And I'll, 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 I'll touch on three examples, more specific examples of how science contributes to the reduction, and then lastly, what the future holds. Okay. Well, before I start, maybe make the, the distinction between nuclear facilities and radiological facilities. A, a nuclear facility is a facility which is associated with the nuclear fuel cycle. In other words, it, it, it deals with fissionable material like uranium or plutonium, and the products from it um, and then you have on the other side, you have what we call radiological facilities, which, which deals more with man-made radioactive material. For example, the radioactive sources, um, medical applications, agricultural applications. So there's a, big, there's a distinction between them and it also results in a significant distinction between the effects that these can have. So in South Africa, we have then only three nuclear installations. Firstly, we have the, the Kuberg nuclear power station down in, in Cape Town, which you're all very familiar with. It's been in operation since 1984, 1985. And one of its unique features is that it's built on a, um, a seismic raft. It's basically, it means it's built on a island with, uh, which is almost independent from the uh, seismology underneath it, which make it, makes it very resistive to, to things like earthquakes. It uses, um, and I say this for, for a specific reason, because you'll, you'll hear later on a bit more about this. Um, then also it is cooled by water from the ocean at a rate of about 80 tons per second, which is a significant amount of water. The waste from Kuberg is uh, stored in, in literally in drums, in, in steel or concrete containers, and that goes to fall pits, which I'll show you just now. But importantly, the high level waste, the waste from the, from the reactor itself is still stored on site. And you'll see later why this is important. Um, and then also one other important aspect is that when it was built in, or constructed in the eighties, it was located quite some distance from the metropolitan areas, and currently it is surrounded, literally almost surrounded by metropolitan by, by the public. This uh, this facility is regulated by the National Nuclear Facility and the National Nuclear Regulator. Um, so is this facility. This is where I work. This is Nexa Nuclear Energy Corporation of South Africa. It's a complex just uh, to, to the west of Pretoria. And it houses several facilities that used to house a enrichment facility um, many years ago. Um, currently it houses a whole range of facilities, but the most important for, for this, uh, this talk is the Safari One Research Reactor. And that was, uh, you can see the picture at the bottom there is the reactor building. And there's a picture of you when you look into the reactor pool. And this was constructed or commissioned back in 1965. So it's, it, is, it is fairly old. 
and it runs at about 20 megawatts. If you if we go back to the slide from Kuberg, you'll see that Kuberg runs two reactors of over 900 megawatts. So it's substantially uh, bigger than this reactor. Um, initially, it used the high enriched uranium. Currently, it uses low enriched uranium. And then the third facility, which is also a nuclear facility and also regulated by the National Re Nuclear Regulator, is the Falpitz Waste repository out at uh, close to Springbok in the Northern Cape. And the picture tells it all. The, the waste is uh, in drums. It gets transported here and it gets disposed here. Um, those the waste needs to meet a whole range of acceptance criteria. One being that it cannot be of a long half-life. So it means it will decay within a fairly short space of time. There would be almost no activity left there. Um, and as you can see, it is fairly remote and uh, the geology is, is very unique there. Okay. Then if I go on to what is a nuclear emergency, uh, I don't think this is uh, anybody has ever been in the space of uh, dealing with emergencies. This is not a unique uh, definition. It's basically a non-routine situation or an event that necess necessitates that you have prompt action to mitigate the consequences for humans, for life and for property and the envi environment. This definition is from the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency. And what you need to consider in an emergency, what we can consider in emergency situations is basically the emergency preparedness and response, which is also not much different from, from the norm. Many people will tell you that radioactive material is just another hazard. It's a class seven hazardous material and you have many other different classes of material and the, the basic principles of, of responding to these are the same. We use the same mechanisms for, for response by the emergency organizations as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about emergency response just in a second. Then another definition I would bring, like to bring to your attention is, is the principles of prevention and the principle of preparedness. That's part of the topic of what, we, what this uh, talk is about. So obviously want to prevent this from happening, but then you need to also be prepared to respond. So the principle of prevention, um, I've listed a few basic ones here. Firstly, um, design. You mean design is, is quite simply the process of um, having a concept, having detailed plans, uh, supporting calculations and specifications for the facility which meets some form of criteria and that criteria we call the design basis. So we, we heard previously in one of the previous um, presenters speaking about the design of water infrastructure. And it, I think it's much the same here. The design of this, this, uh, this facility is, is really important. And, in, and it's in many cases, it's also very standardized across, across the world, specifically referring to nuclear power stations. Um, the second principle would uh, probably be a confinement. Uh, confinement is, 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 is a, a safety function. It's a function which prevents material from being released or getting out of the reactor building or in, out of the building. We saw um, even at fault pits, you have confinement in, by means of drums and geology. The, another principle would be containment. Now that is the physical um, means. In other words, that is the, the, the structure, the, the physical structure. And as you can see on this uh, picture on the right, it, the, the reactor building is, uh, is an, immense, an immense structure. Then ALARA is something which you might have heard before. It's an acronym for a, as low as reasonably achievable, meaning that Whatever you do, whatever you design, whatever you, however you operate, you will always strive to 
to achieve as low waste, as low quantities of waste, as low exposure to, to people and the environment. It's one of the principles. Um, and then a fifth principle I came up with is the is licensing. Licensing being the authorization process where you have some form of oversight uh, to ensure that you comply with legislation and, and, and rules or the conditions of your license. So, so as you can see, there's well, there's more. There would also be things like a defense in death, where you need to have multiple layers of protection, um, where one layer would protect another layer. If one layer fails, you would have another layer of protection. There's uh, also another principle, which is uh, the graded approach. Uh, obviously, you will not construct such an enormous facility if you have a very small reactor. Or when you have to transport radioactive material, you would not have a a very elaborate a container you will have, you might need a small, smaller container. So basically this is the principle of, of prevention prior to, prior to operation and during operation. And then the principle of preparedness, you will probably be very familiar with. It, it most basically means that you need to be uh, prepared by means of planning. Uh, communication is a very important, and we saw that with uh, some of the accidents or more specifically the Fukushima action, how complex the communication mechanisms were with the public and the organizations. Um, you have to you have to rely on intervening organizations. You cannot do everything yourself if you are a, a nuclear facility under duress. Uh, you do regular exercises and your response actions is based on action levels it's a little bit different from operational facilities where you have limits for operation limits dose limits exposure limits in a response scenario you have action levels which helps you to make decisions okay. then um, what does science contribute to what we know and the answer is everything everything we know about radiation is based on some form of uh, research or experiments that were con conducted uh, at some time and space since the discovery of radioactivity. And, and we've learned to, to use those. Um, we, have, we have some authoritative organizations in the space uh, called um, the International Commission for Radiation Protection, the United Nations, uh, committees for the effects on atomic radiation, the World Health Organization, International Atomic Energy. Um, so there's a whole range of authoritative organizations which write some rules and those rules somehow gets back uh, into um, uh, national rules and national le legislation. Um, I, I thought it would be good to maybe touch on three, three fields or disciplines where I think um, we can we can demonstrate how science helps us. One being uh, on humans. The, there's an interesting study called the lifespan study. Um, it concerns the uh, survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, nuclear bombing, atomic bombing in 1945. Um, this study is is still ongoing, and it um, monitored 120,000 people. 94,000 who were survivors of the atomic bombs and about 27 who were unexposed individuals. And by monitoring those um, people and what happens to them and how their um, quality of life and the, the effects um, on, on, well, basically what, the, what you can derive from that is um, some numbers on mortality and cancer incidents. And, and that's, this study forms the basis of what we know today. Um, and, and those values are, are published on the table at the bottom here. And internationally accepted as the uh, risk coefficients for exposure to, to radiation. And that forms the basis for many, many other things. That forms the basis for uh, for deriving limits for exposure to individuals, be it workers, members of the public. It forms the basis ultimately for 
the design of a of a nuclear facility. Um, and and this, I mean this is one of the most authoritative. There's there's many many other of these studies, but this is probably the most authoritative of its kind. Um, and then we also have the International Commission of Radiation Protection, which looks at the fundamental principles um, of radiation protection. This little drawing, what it's trying to tell you is that um, based on many studies and many things that we know, um, we know how individuals are exposed to radiation. And you can get exposed to radiation from so many means. You can eat it, you can drink it, you can be exposed from it, you can swim in it, you can, um, oh, there's just all the different pathways of exposure are considered here. And, um, and, and it's calculated, it's quantified and it's usable. So if you have a scenario where you have a release of radioactive material, you can, you, can, you can evaluate the impact of this to members of the public or even workers based on data that you collect, physical data that you collect about radiation and the environment. Yeah. If we talk a little bit about environmental protection, this is interesting because it was it's a new topic. Environmental protection is something which is less than 10 years, 10 or 20 years old. Um, and the ICRP is now focusing highly on the protection of the environment. Initially, they said if the humans are protected, then the environment's protected, but it's not the case. And there, hence a new term was born, and it's called the reference animal and reference plants. And if we talk a little bit about materials. What we know about science and what science has told us about the effects of radiation in materials, it can be good, it can be bad. Um, we can use it to make materials radioactive. You can um, use a radiolysis, radiolysis where the chemical bonds are break, broken um, and the knowledge from that. An example of that would be water in a reactor, which undergoes, uh, which is exposed to high levels of radiation, causes pyrolysis. And you end up with hydrogen peroxide, which um, which basically attacks the concrete, and you might have cracks in the big structure of yours. Um, the radiation detection instrumentation relies heavily on the ionization of of air to detect um, to, to to be able to measure radioactive um, radioactivity. Um, another example would be the treatment of cancer. What we know about the how Radioactivity interferes with cells. Yeah. Um, I, I added a little picture there at the top about um, uh, there are international there are experiments, not even experiments. It, it's used in practice where fruit flies, male fruit flies, are sterilized by means of radio radioactivity, and they are released into into um, what you call um, in, in well, effectively, they would breed and they would not reproduce. And by doing that, you could be able to eliminate fruit flies in, in forests or in orchards. Yeah. Right. Past nuclear accidents. Basically, there were three big ones. If we exclude um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which, was a, which wasn't an accident. The Three Mile Accident, United States. Um, only released a small amount, but that that was probably the first very damaging accident for the for for the nuclear power environment. The Chernobyl accident, 1986, um, a fair amount of radioactive material was released into the environment. The picture in the middle there shows what's currently happening there. They, it, it it is still a facility which is under decommissioning, even even though it's almost 40 years later. And they'll, they've now built this um, cask over it. Then, more recently, uh, the Fukushima nuclear accident. Um, what happened there, quite simply, was that an earthquake caused a tsunami. A tsunami um, came over the wall of the, the, the power station, which was located next to the ocean. It took out some of the systems. Um, and fortunately, backup power generators were there to help protect the facility, but that was also taken out. The facility effectively became 
hot because they didn't have cooling and it eventually ended up in some um, in fact it, it was a chemical explosion a hydrogen explosion which destroyed the roof and some parts of the facility and that resulted in the release of material but interestingly enough only about a tenth of what was released at the Chernobyl accident so now I'm just going to get to three little examples of, of what we've learned from us or, or how we applied our science, the things we've now, things I've now told you. One is the lessons we've learned from the Fukushima accident. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the international community came together and they evaluated this, uh, this accident, the causes and the effects of it. Uh, and two, really important things came from that. One is that more demanding requirements needs to be in place against uh, external natural hazards. Although they knew what the predictability and the extent of tsunamis is, this, this tsunami was not really um, a severe tsunami. It was a, a combination of the location, um, the duration, um, and the effects of, of the tsunami which resulted in this accident. And from that, the, the outcome of that evaluation was that the international community should uh, consider enhancing the independence of safety levels and bring in more levels of defense, which if you now think about the scenario, the scenario was that um, backup diesel generators were also taken out, second level of defense was taken out. So now all of, all or most of facilities in the whole world were subjected to a safety re-evaluation or what they call a stress test. And they had to consider improving upon the reliability on different safety levels. That's the defense in death principle. Then the other one was the design requirements and it's probably more applicable to facilities which are designed from here on, um, where you previously had to account for typically a um, frequency of one in 10,000 or one in 1,000 years accidents. Um, you now need to consider one in 10,000 years accidents, which makes it a lot stricter. But one of the, the other outcomes was that the United Nations Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation only recently published the, uh, the results from their research on impacts to humans. And they concluded that the outcome or the results from the Fukushima accident, um, cancer rates will remain stable. So no, no increased um, or incremental cancer rates. There's a theoretical increased risk among children for thyroid cancer no impact on birth defects or hereditary effects and no discernible increase in cancer rates for workers. So I think the message here is um, we, we can use what we know about science, we can use what we know about this uh, accident, the results from this accident um, and, and, and all these things come together and you can, you, you can make very valuable um, um, conclusions from this. The second example I want to bring up is so after the the reactor got hot um, and after the generators um, couldn't um, provide backup power for for pumps, what's ha what happens is that the core becomes hotter and hotter and eventually they had core meltdown I think in two of the six units. Even today, they still continue having to be, to cool those units. And by doing so, they are generating an, an astonishing amount of contaminated seawater. They, and as you can see in this picture, this, the, almost the entire facility is now um, packed with all kinds of storage tanks. They do clean this water, but what they cannot clean out of this water is tritium. Um, Basically, tritium is almost too small to to filter out. So they manage. So so they are currently sitting with one. What's it? One point three million tons of this treated water. 
as to water, which has a, a tritium in it. You can see that there is the value of the tritium. It's about it's about a trillion becquerels, almost a petabecquerel. And what did I do with this water? By by knowing what the effects are of tritium on humans, um, the ocean, um, on biota, the and knowing how it will behave in the ocean, knowing what the the, the characteristics of this ocean is in terms of um, sea um, sea streams and and how it will disperse. Um, they were able to do an assessment, and by doing that assessment, um, uh, you can you can quantify what this what what would be the effect of releasing so much tritium into into the ocean, and ultimately they concluded that it would would be minimal. I think the, the term they use is negligible, and and this was supported by um, the IAEA, and they do have some resistance from the public still. But print the, the science behind this is sound. And ultimately, um, the scientific community is in agreement that that, that, that those vast amount of tritium can ultimately be released into the ocean. Yeah. And then the third example that I will bring to your attention is a very interesting one. Um, and that is the, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Um, it's a body of the United Nations, um, and its aim is to, to prevent nuclear tests or nuclear explosions. And um, it being a treaty, the member states of the United Nations um, has, to, has to sign onto the treaty, not all the countries have. But what they've done in the meantime is they have established an inter international monitoring system across the globe. It has 337 facilities, which consist of um, seismic, hydroacoustic, infrasound, and radionuclide monitoring stations. So they are they are measuring or monitoring um, all kinds of seismic, um, what you could events, and hydroacoustic events under the ocean, and infrasound events, and they're also continuously monitoring for radionuclides in the air. Now, it, it, well, it's interesting because um, the radio nuclide monitoring station would be the only means of confirming that it is indeed a nuclear test. It can be many other things, but it, the radio nuclide station is the only one which can confirm. Now, this international monitoring station has many, many, many advantages, and that's the, that they've learned over time. Um, but they can do real-time detection of earthquake and tsunamis and they can and they can predict tsunamis now even well before it happens it, the lead time is still quite short um, they you could they can also uh, monitor the dispersal from nuclear accidents by having these uh, stations um, radionuclide stations monitoring for radionuclides in the air and they can also um, predict volcanic eruptions by performing these different kinds of seismic. One interesting example of how this technology was applied was the Beirut explosion. And that explosion was detected by five different monitoring stations as far away as 6,000 kilometers from Beirut. Um, they monitored it by different technologies, they picked it up by, by seismic, infrasound, as well as they were able to use surface, the observations we, we spoke of, the, the, one of the earlier um, speakers uh, talked about, the surface observations, they could use um, all of that. And what they've managed to do is they were able to locate the um, location or determine the location with a 44 kilometer accuracy within hours of the event. 
in fact, they knew about this and they triangulated this before it was on any television station anywhere in the world. They were also able to use this technology to do a yield estimation. Of, um, in other words, they said it was close to one uh, kiloton explosion. And the, all the analysis afterwards, they were, they were actually very, very close. Okay. And one other example of how they used the CTBTO technology was the Democratic Republic of Korea. They still didn't do with this. They're not a signatory to the treaty yet. And they still in 2006, they conducted what they called a announced nuclear test um, in Korea. And oh, as it was actually in the sea. And the International Monitoring Station was able to pick that up with 20, 20 different stations. And they confirmed it only two weeks later by measuring radioactivity xenon in the air in Canada. In 2009, they were able to, to, to uh, pick it up with 60 stations. In 2013, it were, they picked it up with what's it, 94 seismic, two infrasound, and four radioactive stations. And the last a few, 2016, 2016, 2017, more than 100 stations were able to pick this up. Yeah. Um, so the, the, these were three examples of how we can use what we know about radioactivity and apply it to different and in different means. And ultimately, all of these, all three of these, this do deal with uh, how we manage and how we monitor and how we predict the desire and nuclear disasters. Uh, I could not resist to put this in. What does the future hold? Um, small modular reactors. I saw the headline um, of the New York Times the other day. It says, the future of nuclear is small, referring to small modular reactors. Um, so basically a small modular reactor is a, a reactor which only generates about 300 megawatts um, of uh, electricity. And because of that, because of it being small, it has so many advantages. Um, it, it's cheaper, so smaller countries can use it. You can use it for factories, so smaller applications. You can easily plug into the grid in it's also flexible in, in terms of location. Um, but I think from, from our perspective uh, as the nuclear community, it means that it's also much safer. Safer meaning you have the advantage now already to determine what the design requirements of this should be. And given that you're looking at such a small um, facility, the inventory of radioactivity active material would be so much smaller as well. And should, for some reason, there be a emergency or a scenario and a, an accident at one of these facilities, the impact would be significantly less than a place like Fukushima, because you, you, you're only dealing with a small reactor. So, this is, I think I said my basic, my last slide, it's in order to embrace this new technology, it must be very clear that the benefits far exceed the risk. And the IAEA is currently assessing the safety standards to determine how this fits into the, the current um, regime that they have. And they had a conference last year and currently there are more than 70 designs which are considered Small, small modular reactor designs in the world. And then I was asked to to make some take home point, take home points. I think I must have told you by now that nuclear is inherently safe, and it's based on sound scientific principles. It can be prevented by us learning and improving on on the mistakes we make. And um, finally. Uh, science contributes to preventing accidents, but accidents also contribute to improving our understanding of science and the validation of models. And with that, I thank you.